today I'm just going into how to start Vim itself. So, of course, the best way to do it is to type Vim my file.txt. So that's pretty much it. And I, uh, you know, <laughs> ha ha. Yeah. But for real. So when you start Vim, what you're actually doing is starting Vim in just what you would call um, just, I guess, normal Vim mode. And what I mean when I say that is I'm not talking about like normal versus insert versus visual or whatever. It's actually uh, different startup modes which can change how um, Vim behaves. Um, you can trigger those in a few ways. You can do them through command line flags. Uh, you can do them through uh, changing a setting in your VimRC file or running an X command via command mode. Um, and a couple of them can actually be triggered just by normal mode commands. Now you can set up mappings to also do your own custom things, but some of them are built in. In fact, one of them was one I just happened to know uh, from researching this talk, which was the shift Q thing. Um, so that was actually triggering the X mode. And the most interesting way it changes is if the name of the program that you're running changes. So what that means is if you run Vim, but you don't call it Vim, you call it something else, it actually changes how Vim behaves. So if you've ever, for instance, when you're typing, getting out of a shell or something, if you like, just hit X instead of exit, uh, it might have popped up a thing that said, you know, the uh, starting in X mode type visual to go back to normal mode. So you were actually running Vim, probably, assuming it wasn't X itself, uh, which was an older editor. Um, but X and VI were always the same thing. Oh, they were? Yeah. I mean, it started as EX and then it um, See. got a visual mode. Right. So Which I, was not the visual mode of Vim, but the normal mode of Vim. Right. So, yeah, that's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, my history is not, well, history I, is not my strong suit. I started on EX. Oh, okay. VI gotcha. didn't exist yet. Right. Because terminals were too slow. Right. Yeah, naturally. Um, so one thing is they have to be a uh, symlinks or a full-on copy of this binary. Um, it can't just be uh, the it can't it can't be uh, an alias. If you set an a, a bash alias for this, what's actually going to be sent to Vim as its first argument, the name of the executing program, is going to wind up being Vim or whatever you aliased it from. Are you sure a symlink will work? I think it has to be a hard link. Uh, I've used it with symlinks because really? what's what winds up being sent to the program is that is the uh, thing that okay. symbol. Now that could be OS dependent. I've only ever tried it on a laptop. Uh, I'm sure you're right. So it works with hard links though too. Well, yeah, that, I didn't even think to say that, but yeah, that would that would work as well. Um, so there are several names. I'm not going to go over all of them, but I'll go over a few of the more interesting ones. Uh, there's of course VI and Vim. Um, and normally those just will start the same thing, but there are certain OS dependent things about that. Like for instance, um, on CentOS, and this is only when running as root, this is not when running as a normal user. Uh, if you type VI, you'll get some special copy of Vim that was compiled such, in such a way that it loads a different VimRC file that doesn't have compatible or no compatible set. Whereas Vim is always going to execute a VimRC file. Uh, and OS X, uh, it, during uh, Tushar's talk, he referenced how he had Homebrew installed. And it, for instance, installs a binary called Vim, uh, which you know comes earlier in the path, but it doesn't install uh, a link to a VI. And um, OS X's uh, VI is symlinked to its own Vim. So that's why you know you got different behavior between you know your when VI and Vim. Yeah. I still have that problem. <laughs> right. So if you if you aliased it in your uh, in in your bash RC or something, yeah. that probably fix that problem. Uh, there's obviously GVim for starting it with a graphical editor. Um, there's View, which starts it with a read-only flag set. Um, X, as we've discussed, is starting it in X mode. Um, there's XIM, which is improved X mode. Uh, Vim diff, which allows you to do visual diffs, and rvim, which is a restricted type of vim, and uh, easy vim, 
which could be helpful, maybe. We'll see. Um, so read only is really just about as uh, as firm as you decide it will be. It basically just warns you before you try to write a file that hey, read only is set. You can't write this file. But if you, for instance, you know, put an exclamation point on it on that uh, colon w command, it will go ahead and save anyway. It's kind of like if you change the file ownership on a, or the file modes on a file you own to like not allow writing, well, of course, you could just change them back if you wanted to. So it's just, it's really more of a hint thing than anything else. It's like uh, restricted access in Ruby. Right. It's easily gotten around. Right. Um, so of course, you could start this with the, by naming the command view. You could also start it with the uh, dash capital R flag, with just Vim. Um, or once you're inside of Vim, you could actually say set read only. Um, one thing that's kind of cool about this is you can actually use Vim as a pager instead of less or more. Uh, so if you provide that dash, it'll just read from standard in so that you know, anything piped to it will just open up in Vim. Just kind of cool. Uh, one thing that kind of is not cool about that is uh, if you have all the color codes set on um, Git, it's going <laughs> to dump out a lot of color codes because Vim doesn't understand uh, shell color codes. Uh, and then there's the X man, like we said, behaves just like X before there was there was VI for visual mode. Um, there really aren't that many visual components, um, and you can really only do things with command mode. Naturally, uh, start with X, or you can start with uh, dash E, or as I mentioned, you can start by just when in normal mode pressing a capital Q. I've occasionally gone into it by accident uh, when trying to do something else, like for instance, recording a macro with my caps lock on. <laughs> uh, that happens sometimes. Um, and if you want to get back to uh, the visual mode, you can just type you know, visual, visual command. And that'll bring, back, bring you back to normal again. Uh, there's improved X, which is basically the same deal, except it's kind of a um, little bit more bells and whistles. There's tab completion on the commands line, rather than just requiring you to type out the commands in full, which is kind of nice. Um, and a few other bells and whistles. I have, didn't really investigate it too thoroughly. There's not, unfortunately, much documentation describing what the differences between these two modes are. It's basically like two paragraphs uh, that says, it's improved. <laughs> um, so to start it, you could either call it with xm vim dash capital E or uh, lowercase g capital Q in, uh, in normal mode. And again, I did, to get back to the regular uh, visual mode of vim, you just type colon visual. Uh, now, restricted mode in vim is uh, an interesting one. It prevents anything that would go and fetch data from the shell. Uh, from actually running. So when I actually tried to start this myself, I had a whole bunch of errors dump out from various plugins I had installed, which go out to the shell to try and retrieve information. So if you are trying a new plugin it, and you're particularly paranoid, you could do this and it might uh, you know, save you some headaches. Um, so you know, I'm not really sure what other use cases there are for this mode, but I'm not, again, particularly paranoid or um, security conscious. So, uh, so that would be rvim or vim dash capital Z. Now, one thing is I haven't figured out, and I don't think there is by its nature as perhaps a security feature, a way to turn this off once you've started vim. So, you know, you would have to completely exit out and start without this mode on uh, to prevent it from happening. Uh, the vim diff uh, is pretty cool. It's nice to be able to see the actual comparison of two files um, when you've uh, got some changes that need to happen. Um, and uh, you know, you would just start this with uh, you know vimdiv uh, or dash d, um, or if you have multiple uh, windows open in vim side by side. You can actually run uh, that's this diff this command in each one. It actually sets several different settings in um, 
in Vim in each buffer to get it to work. Uh, and so diff this will set all of those variables for you. I don't know the best way to turn it back off. I always just wind up exiting completely out of Vim and starting back over again. You could probably just turn off all those variables and get it to work, but I don't know them all. You mean how to get out of the Vim diff windows? Actually, right. I mean, you can you can close the, uh, the the windows themselves individually and down to one window. But um, as far as like disabling whatever additional settings been set to get into diff mode, I I mean, you'd have to remember what all of them are, or maybe I think write a command to 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 do all those for you. What's interesting about uh, Vim diff is that you can actually use it uh, if you ever have like. If you're using Git, um, you can actually use it as a merge tool, um, so that you know you can um, so that you can easily just use Vim to resolve any conflicts. Um, uh, so, so there's actually a whole topic in Vim, uh, so I'm not going to go into how to do that, but it's it's something you can do. Ah. Um, now, easy mode is supposed to be better for people who just um, who just uh, are starting with Vim. But what's interesting about it is, uh, you know, it keeps it forces you to stay inside of insert mode, um, which is kind of interesting. Uh, so you can start this with evim or vim dash y, or if you want to start it once you're already in Vim, you can run this really long command to. Mm -hmm load the script that does this. What's interesting is I'm curious if there's any thoughts as to how you would quit this once you've started it. But how do you... I mean, other visual... Now I, colon visual? Colon, uh, you're in insert mode. Colon visual is just going to type Oh, yeah. Type it does it. escape take you out? No. It must be something special. So it, basically, it, it turns it into notepad. <laughs> more, more or less. <laughs> yes. I um, mean, you can't. I mean, maybe GVim you might be able to use. You can probably just close the window. Or you might be able to use like the the menu. You know, the the GUIs. The GUIs. How do you save the file? Right. Yeah. So I think this probably would be best if you are using yeah. the graphical Vim. I wouldn't think that I would want to use this on the terminal. There must be a way. Uh, well, there is a way. There is a way, and it's weird. I don't know why it is. But I had to Google this. <laughs> uh, it's actually pressing Control L. That'll put you back in normal mode. I don't, I don't know why. Um, so did, I wonder if they map other commands to the controls. Like and maybe I, I assumed that maybe it was going to behave like Nano or something. So right. I tried to use like Control X, but that didn't do it. So yeah, it it was very weird. But that puts you back in normal mode, and then I presume you can do normal mode and stuff from there. But yeah, I don't know. I. I think easy is a little <laughs> bit of a misnomer. So, Vim can be started with multiple files at once. Um, so, if you provide it with multiple file names, it will load them all in blockers, as it calls them. Uh, and if you're running Vim diff, for instance, it will want at least two file names naturally because it will, it will want two things to compare. Um, if you have done this, you can go back and forth with uh, you know the previous and next commands, or for even next. Commands, uh, so that you know you can. I, I frequently do this if I want to edit multiple files in sequence. I'll you know open them all up, write one, do next, like colon next. You know, make my edits colon next. Uh, that makes it a little. Easy. You you can also use colon m. Right. Instead yeah. of next. Right. I actually often wind up doing a colon wn. So it's like yeah, right that's, that's what I used. I also do that. So uh, you can you can sort of stack things up in an interesting way that way as well. No, of course. Yeah, I think you can delete and yank from one of them to the next. Yes. yes or the previous. Correct. Um, and of course, if you've edited them, in most cases, unless you've set a particular setting in Vim, it will demand that you save the file before you move to a different buffer. So you know, if you try to hit next and you've got some unsaved changes, it's going to be like no. Um, alternately, if you're comfortable with using splits, you can use flags, the dash 
lowercase o will open with a horizontal split and the dash cap will open with a vertical split rather than opening them in uh, buffers that take up the entire screen. On the command line? Yeah. So if you do vim dash o file one, file two, it's going to. Um, side by side. Uh, the well, lowercase well, o is okay. on top of each other, the uppercase o is side by side. So. Um, here's where I think the kind of cooler stuff is. Uh, so, dash c will allow you to execute any x command, uh, and this is, yeah, this one is before any vimrc script loads. Um, any x commands naturally that have spaces or special shell characters have to be escaped uh, or properly quoted. Um, what I think this one might be particularly useful for is like if you had some particular different way you wanted your vimrc to behave, you could say, okay, let me set this variable. And then, you know, it'll it'll set that before the vimrc loads, and then you know the vimrc will be, you know do your proper contextual settings. Um, when you execute vim, you can uh, provide multiple invocations of this dash c, but you can actually only use ten of them total. Of course, they could be multi-line. Um, yeah, potentially. Sure. Um, you just use the shell. But the other thing you can do... Yeah, I think you can do semicolons between commands. Uh, I think it's a bar. Oh, yeah, right. Um, so this uh, another thing you can do is you can put a whole script file together and use this dash capital S um, and the script file name to actually load the, load the script so that you, know, you can sort of get around that by saying, okay, let me just put it all in the script. Now you can only have 10 total of the dash C and dash capital S commands all together. But again, if you're using this dash capital S, you're probably just sticking a whole bunch of stuff in a, uh, in a script file anyway. So you probably should only need one or two of them. Okay. Um, strangely enough, I think when you leave off uh, the argument to uh, dash capital S, it assumes session.vim is the name of the file you want to load. Um, this is for just saving session state um, their plugins to help you manage these things, uh, manage sessions. Again, that might be a whole separate topic, dealing with sessions. So dash u allows you to load an alternate vimrc file instead of just defaulting to whatever your vimrc is. Um, and this is actually where I finally figured out why all those plugin managers tell you to set no compatible, because of course I was thinking any time you have a vimrc file that exists, it automatically sets no compatible. So why do you need that? Turns out, if you use this dash u to subvert that, you need to set the no compatible yourself. <coughs> so this way you can try out multiple different uh, vimrc files and still have them behave the same way as though the, uh, if, if you provide set no compatible uh, in those VMRC, alternate vimrc files, it will still uh, work. Um, there's a special uh, string uh, Cap, all caps none to say, you know, just don't bother loading any vimrc file at all. Um, and if you're doing just some quick processing, uh, that can be helpful, especially if your vimrc winds up making it so that starting up vim takes a while. Um, there's another flag that's similar to dash c, which is dash dash cmd, which basically waits until all the vimrcs are loaded and then starts executing things. So this could be more useful if, for instance, you have, uh, you want to use some of the uh, plugins that you've got installed. You know, this will, uh, anything you provide to dash dash cmd will execute after all those plugins are loaded. Similarly to the dash c, um, only 10 of these are allowed. Um, but this is actually a different set of 10. So you can have 10 dash S's and 10 of uh, these dash dash CMD. So, yeah, it's, it's strange that it's different, but it is different. So it's worth it. Um, 10 before, 10 after. Well, 10. 10 before your MRC BIM, and 10 after. Yeah, yeah, basically. Um, and an alias for this is the just a straight plus uh -huh. instead of a minus. I've used that in the distant past. Right. So uh, I just figured I'd close out with a few examples of what you might be able to do with this. Um, 
Oh, and I should have had a slash G at the end of that. But basically, this would allow you to, you know, it's going to skip processing the uh, VimRC because I'm not going to need it for anything. Uh, and it will perform the X command, uh, the, the search and replace command. Uh, so it will change an old class name into a new class name throughout the file and then save it and exit. So you just turn it into sev? Basically. Um, I think just because it's, uh, you know, something you can easily... Uh, yeah, it's really nice. Think of. Um, one interesting X command that isn't commonly thought of as an X command is just a number. And what that means is basically jump to this line number. So if you have, for instance, an error message that says, you know, error on line whatever in the file, you can open the file up with that and that'll jump straight to that line, um, which just saves a few keystrokes to get you there. Um, and, you know, you can get arbitrarily complex with these uh, X commands. So this would actually go, it would use this G command to search for the data section and then use a range, basically. So it would jump to there and then um, use the range of, uh, that line to the dollar, which uh, if you remember from Robert's talk, uh, is the last line in the file. And the G is the global command. Global, yes, thank you. And so the G says execute the D on the range specified, which is from wherever it finds carrot underline blah 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 data to the end of the file. Right. You have two data sections, but it'll delete all of them. Right, yeah. So this will be the first one it finds to the end. Right. And then, of course, it saves and exits. And then you can get, like, again, really crazy. I just, um, I just wanted to cram this one into, a, into, a, uh, into the talk real quick before the end because I uh, spent a little while fighting with this. But basically, <laughs> this one jumps to the end of the file, searches for the last use statement, uh, inserts a line, and then searches for every uh, instance of a subroutine in the file and copies it to that point in the file. So you can uh, basically uh, create a list of subroutines from that uh, from that uh, file. From use on down. Yeah, Assu assuming that you know you, all your use statements are at the top right. of the file, and then you wanted to. Um, uh, so why couldn't you just start at the beginning? Oh, because you want to... Because uh, I wanted to create the list of subroutines after all the use statements. Uh. And yeah, I mean, this is really, I, I don't even know a proper use case for this, but I saw somebody wrote a similar uh, thing and I was trying to figure out how to do it. I think it. it's good. Yeah. Um, I, I saw them u using it, but uh, shelling out to grep. And I was like, I feel like there's a way to do this in inside of Vim without going to show. So you can actually do this in uh, restricted mode. Um, so, now, uh, for real, uh, are there any questions? Uh, just one. What is the, I don't know if I'm going to be able to remember it, the no compatible, I've, I've just never messed with the, the what was the question? Was it the no compatible? It's not when no, you're oh, saying no compatible. Not compatible. Yeah. Um, well, for a long time, I just did it because basically all the plugin managers said to do it. But essentially, that just makes sure that uh, Vim doesn't try to pave too much like VI. If, uh, if they're if you say compatible, you're limited to what was in VI. Uh, and a lot of plugins use stuff that's not in VI, uh, so, so you're saying not you have to say no compatible. Okay, right. Yeah, I feel like I feel like there's probably still a few things that are different, even if you say set compatible, I feel like Vim is still probably a little different. But I don't yeah, know probably sure. the replaying the history on the command line, on the yeah. AX line, that wasn't in VI. That was a real pain. Right. So I bet if you set compatible, you still get that, at least I hope. I would just, yeah, I would think so too. A comment? Hmm? A comment instead of a question? Oh, uh, okay. I never understood the G command until now. Really? Thank you. Okay. I've never used it. Oh really? Yeah, I uh, I've seen it a few times. Most of the time, all I really do is I use it to uh, print out all the lines that match a certain thing. So uh, like if I'm 
if I want to find all instances of some variable in a file, I'll do like colon g slash some search pattern slash p. That's basically what does the p do? Print. print. Oh, and what does it print? It? Just to this standard out. It like, oh. um, so you know, prints it all out and it says like hit enter to continue and hit enter. Oh, to okay. So you it's segment just replaced the 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 list. I mean, so you are in the file and then you press the colon g the pattern and then p right mm -hmm. it's a, inside the vim normal mode or command mode yeah yeah and you have to you have to use um, g to get it well but it, oh because it's global it goes to every line that matches that right and then does a p and then i guess you could then copy and paste that to somewhere if you needed it um i mean you could select and copy and paste it with your mouse but um if you wanted to um if you to to do something with it elsewhere in Vim, I think you'd have to change the command from print to something else. Like for instance, I use the copy command, which I just abbreviated to CO. Uh, and what is it? Copies all of them into one, into the anonymous buffer. Um. No, copy actually copies the line to wherever you are in the file. So, oh. or to wherever you direct it to. So what that double quote I did there um, was to cause it to print to wherever the last jump was, which was basically... Can I see that? Uh, let's see. Let's jump back here. Um, actually oh, so it's, not, it's CO for the EX copy command? Um, yeah. Yeah, be. yeah, so... Um, and the thing is, if you just hit, like... Um, CEO, I think it would actually copy it to wherever the search result was. So I had to provide that double. And the quote quote is back to your last jump form. Right, which is where I s executed the command from, mm -hmm. which in this particular case is a line below the last used statement in the file. Do you mind emailing these things to all of us? I mean, I, I can certainly email them. Uh, or, what, I mean, once you put them up, that's fine, but right. until then. Right, yeah. That would well, be I, great. <laughs> 